Tatiana Pusari says that horrific abuse and torture left her unable to care for her youngest child, resulting in the death of the 10-month-old baby girl named Mary. I always, always, always hoped that things would get better. And he said, when you found her, she was already believed to be deceased, right? Yes. So you found the child an hour and a half ago? Yeah. And called your lawyer first, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, I would advise you to be careful what you say from here on out. You will answer to the Lord for everything that is said against me. I didn't think there was anything wrong with her. A homicide, felony murder. It is life without parole. This video features Seth Welch and Tatiana Fusari, whose neglect led to the death of their 10-month-old daughter, Mary Welch. As parents to three children, it was their youngest, Mary, who became the central point when she died on August 2, 2018. The initial 911 call immediately signaled to investigators that serious issues were at play. How long ago did you find that child? Uh, it's about an hour and a half. I um, was waiting. I called my lawyer for the to ask, you know, what's the next thing I could do? And they said, wait till uh, they're here to call. Uh, you know, the police and get back on me. Uh, basically, got the phone where I was waiting for them, and I just kind of went ahead and did it anyway. They're all not here. So I was just, I, I was waiting on legal counsel. So you found the child an hour and a half ago? Yeah. And called your lawyer first, correct? Yeah. Okay. Are there any other children in the home right now? Yeah. Because I don't okay. know if I'm supposed to call the police or not. I, I have no idea what to do. Okay. We will set someone out. We're going to investigate. Um, when was the last time that you had contact with a child? Uh, last night. Um, about last, yeah, yesterday afternoon, about 3 uh, p.m. You know, to go to the bed. What time do we usually have dinner? Oh, uh, well, that's in our head since they're not all, they're not all kind of run out and get to the bus seat. Yeah, you know, basically Easton, uh, you know, he's off for a half hour after that, and no doubt for that. Okay. And how old are the other children? Uh, four and a few. There are two other children? Yeah. And they're at home right now, right? Yep. During the 911 call, the operator shifted from respondent to interrogator, shocked by what was revealed. The caller, after discovering his baby not breathing, had contacted his lawyer before calling 911 and admitted to not checking on the baby for nearly 38 hours. Worse still, it took 90 minutes after finding no heartbeat to report the incident. This led the dispatcher to not only send officers to the Kent County home, but also to suspect child neglect. The officers' observations at the scene, including scarce baby food, a home littered with mice feces, and a filthy mattress where the baby was found, supported this suspicion. To uncover crucial details, both parents were brought in for questioning. By listening in to their separate interrogations, the gravity of neglect the child suffered becomes painfully clear. While Tatiana faced the questions, Seth waited almost two hours for his turn with the detectives. From the onset, it's evident which parent carries a heavier burden of guilt for their loss. Tatiana, this is my supervisor. We've seen each other, but I don't think we've met. I'm sorry for your loss. I know that uh, I think the last thing you want to be doing is this. Man, sorry about that. I'm right now with Tatiana. It's taking me a while to get through it, so let me give it a chance. But what? Tatiana remains composed during her interrogation, greeting the detective with a handshake, while Seth displays a sense of entitlement and adopts a defensive posture, ignoring the detective's apology. Although not directly incriminating, these behaviors contribute to a growing body of evidence. Seth's frustration comes partly from having to wait for two hours as Tatiana reveals details. Um, really, what I kind of just like to do is just uh, to get a better understanding of how we are here today. Um, kind of go back a few years even just to get to know you and your family a little bit. So okay. do you go by Tantiana or do you have a nickname? Tatiana. Tantiana? Okay. Nickname's not really seem to work. You can just give us an easy nickname. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. 
How many children do you have? I... Sorry. Bye. Three. Three. Okay. Yep. <laughs> right. Yeah. Medical issues or any nothing like all. that. Okay. No, no. And for is she in any kind of daycare? Does she go? No. Does she have preschool? Um, no, I homeschool. I have my um my degree in early childhood oh, education. Oh, you do. Okay. So I, Good for you. But for being at home at the farm, I can at least give them an initial education before yeah. Yeah. I just decide to send them off to work grade school. Absolutely. So. Has Um, so does, um, a doctor that she sees, does she have a primary doctor? Not anymore. We okay. did have, it's great and everything. We just, uh, we only go with there's an issue and there just hasn't been. I'm good. Maybe, maybe six months. Six months. Maybe. Yeah, I don't want to budget to it. I know it's a while ago. And so at early six... Early enough for her to get... Well, it was, we were, um, yeah, early enough for her to get her vaccination. Or that, well, I was consistent with it. And then afterwards, they, we just did a lot of research. And we didn't feel the need to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Lynn Schill was very um, gracious with us and understanding. And sure. Like, you actually don't have to do that at all. Mm-hmm. I'm very anti-medical industry is because of uh, what happened with her birth. Um, she coughed one time, uh, and uh, so they said that they had to keep her under observation for 72 hours to make sure she didn't have a breathing problem. She didn't have a breathing problem. She coughed one time to clear some birth fluid out of her lungs. Right. And they kept us under observation for 72 hours. Um, oh, wow, you're paying for it? Of course, yeah, the bill was about $15,000. So, mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of, um, that was kind of a kick in the rear. Uh, and then afterwards we had some problems where I actually had a doctor uh, make a fraudulent CPS claim and I actually forged paperwork and stuff like that. And I tried to make a complaint about it. Both parents adopted an anti-medical system stance. Seth openly expressed this viewpoint early on, while Tatiana's perspective emerged through various accounts concerning her daughter. So, um, so that was that was about my last straw with it. Um, was that was that to do with the helmet? And is yeah. that all, so it all started with, if I'm right, it all started with the helmet. At what visit? Obviously, it was probably the last visit, mm -hmm. is when he recommended the helmet, the yeah. head shaping. But so there was never any concern about the shape of her head from zero to 18 months? No, it, and it, that's why it was such a concern for us as to why you would just bring this up out of out of nowhere. And so what was the problem with the shape of her head according to him? It was, it was off. It was just not circular. And I mean, I wasn't offended. I was just taken aback. And then um, my stuff uh, found out that they, it's commission-based with these products that they try and push. Uh -huh. So um, we don't know specifically this is here today. Sure. But we think that we're we're trying to push the helmet. It was a $3,000 helmet for that and called GPS and said that we were being neglectful or for something out there. Okay. And uh, then that's when we went to So was it the first time he ever pushed that home? Was it right on the 18 month? That's the first I time he ever? I believe so. Mm, okay. Unless he spoke to Seth otherwise, but I, I doubt it. Oh. Uh, I'm not a big fan of a lot of the immunization stuff, and so I kind of balked against that, and they didn't like that either. Um, you know, they even got to the point where they, um, the first time we changed doctors, they called GPS on us just for changing doctors, because the doctor we were seeing was all the way in Byron Center. I've never even heard of a head shaping helmet. Have you, have you ever seen young children? It looks like um, some children with Down syndrome will wear it, and it's just, it like cuts here, and it cuts like that. And it's big and clear. Maybe I have seen that. It, maybe I have, yeah. It, it looks quite invasive, and I just, I'm heavy. And I just want to like get neck problems or back problems or shit. Mm. Right, 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 yeah. When a doctor suggested a costly head shaping helmet, they researched, declined the advice, and sought a new doctor. While usually, this wouldn't prompt a call to Child Protective Services, 
doctors are authorized to report if they suspect abuse or neglect. Welch and Tatiana shared their perspectives, but the doctor who recommended the helmet might provide insights into potential neglect or abuse they omitted. Interestingly, Tatiana and Seth gave different reasons for CPS involvement. Tatiana attributed it to the helmet refusal, while Seth believed it was due to changing doctors. The detectives are narrowing their focus, particularly questioning why the neglect seemed to target only their youngest daughter and not her siblings. This inquiry leads to a discussion about the older children being born in hospitals, as opposed to the youngest's home birth. How does that work? Wonderful. Was that was that a choice? Yeah. Was that like um, what do they call it, like a uh, midwife or something? Yeah, it was a home birth. Okay, I so how does that work when you choose to have? First off, I mean, why did you go from being from her in a hospital and some transformation here where you said we want to do um, um, the midwives? Yeah. Yeah. The um, being at the hospital was very amazing. They. Uh, with me after she was born they wanted her out of the room they wanted to stay for three days um because uh apparently i pushed out a lot more fluid than they were expecting so she coughed and i'm like oh we need to keep her protesting and then um that just makes it because they just wanted to charge us more i don't know mm -hmm. conspiracy theory yada yada whatever yeah, they never all go right exactly right. They don't. so i just think they wanted to keep us there for three more days and then yet yeah. They wouldn't like allow me to see her except to nurse. And I was like, oh, you can just keep her here. And don't worry, you can rest. I want to see my baby. Yeah. And they would have like Wick come in and give me information that you and I have newborn portraits. The whole guy just go Right, right, right. So we just didn't want anywhere. So that just turned you off to the. And having a home birth right after uh, I gave birth, Seth went out and bought me a pizza and I ate that whole pizza. <laughs> Right. Hey, bonus. Right. That's why I just didn't, it never, you know, bothered me too much that she was skinny because she was, she came out. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, when did it first, when did it like dawn on you that she's thin? Oh, dude, when she came out, where she had just been up pacing around all night and then baby starts sliding out. And things are a lot easier when you do them at home, I'll tell you what. Well, you don't have to drive anywhere. <laughs> yeah. And, and the position they put you in in the hospital is there. You, it's bad medicine. It's whatever. What position in the home? And then you just stand up. Do you really? Yeah, and the gravity just shoots the baby right down. You don't. They don't have you up, facing upward, pushing against the gravity. Makes no sense. Um, no, it actually, would make sense if you think about it. That, yeah. I, Never seen it. So you you have to just kind of be under there. Like you're you're like quarterback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She she got up there. She got up there. Um, uh, you know, she was late for the delivery. She checked over the baby, said she's healthy. And, you know. Is that what she does? Does a midwife they kind of tie off their tubes or whatever it is they have to do? And they just they <laughs> yes, they do the dirty work that anybody could do. It's just a lot, lot of us aren't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of us aren't willing to do it. But yeah, really, what they I mean, they you know they mop up the blood and yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> So, you're, how does the midwife work? Is that through a hospital, through a clinic? How do you reach? Yeah. How does this? How does uh, this work? Google. <laughs> oh, okay. I just searched on midwives in the area, or um, also their Facebook groups like Home Birth um, in West Michigan, Cedar Springs um, Home Birthing, and I just asked a lot of different women for advice. So. so now, what is a what what is a midwife? Is it someone that knows what they're doing, or can I be a midwife? Uh, you cannot be midwife. You okay. need medical training. Well, okay, that's a, that's what okay. I wanted. So they is, is it like actually a certification? Yes. Oh, okay. Right. Um, and she she's been training with her grandmother. Excuse me. Nope, that's all right. She's been training with her grandmother, so I trusted. I like the genealogy. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Yeah, she gave birth to all three of her kids at her home. Mm. Um, she's been doing it for about forty years before me. So you know, like over, like you know, your check sheet of. Check this to see if the baby's out, you know? Yeah, yeah. So. And then do, do they do all the recording of birth, or is that something you guys do, or? I, I think ish. Yeah, it seems like they my, my wife kind of deals with more of the paperwork. <laughs> For a parent mourning a child, Seth's significant smile raises questions. His description of the childbirth suggests a risky scenario where the baby could have easily been injured during delivery either hitting the ground or a couch if not caught. 
This precarious birth might have provoked the doctor to contact Child Protective Services, suspecting head trauma or other issues. Additionally, their avoidance of formal medical assistance doesn't justify maintaining a home in the condition described by the detectives. Interviewing the parents separately allows detectives to highlight inconsistencies in their accounts. Bottle feed, breast feed, pump, uh, So when you gave birth, work? Yeah. Okay, where did you work at? At the Cedar Springs Meyer. So when you were working at Cedar Meyer, while you were at work, did you leave work to breastfeed or did you leave pumped bottles at home for shop to feed? I left pumped bottles at home. Okay. So how do you do that? When you when you set up your pump, I mean, I know how the pump works, mm -hmm. but is that something you refrigerate, something you freeze, something you do fresh every day? What about, uh, so how does that work? Uh, it depends on my shift, but usually it's, it's, I pump fresh every day and I will leave one out on the counter, reach around the fridge, and then there will be some in the freezer. So if he does run out during the day, there's some extra in the freezer on those days where I'm just, pardon my language, but a little more swollen than Yeah, right, yeah. Usual. So um, what was um, Tatiana working? No. So, so Tatiana was home and, and she did all the feedings, yeah. right, right from the source. Right. Um, if if Tatiana went to Meyer, yes. and that was in case she had the latch on, yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. So, because with the other two, Tatiana would leave a food source at home because she was working some. Um. Oh yeah. When she would go to um the farmers market for farm produce business. Um. But last year, which is last year, we did that. She took both kids with her pretty much every time. Okay. Where I couldn't go to market anymore, so. I stay at home and work on the farm. Yep. So, um, so feeding the children has never been a real part of your response. Like more. Well, I've been like I've been feeding like her her dinner. Uh, you know, I feed her tons of salad food. I feed her three or four of those you know those Gerber cups. Oh, yep. She just wolf them right down, no problem. What, were you were you guys buying salad food or making salad food? Both. Okay. What what were you making? If we made anything, it was just like sweet potatoes, grind it up, and yeah, you know, she made the thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what she what she was saying is um, what she could recall where is is um, like some vegetables out of your garden, oh, yeah. uh, maybe whatever it was you had growing at that time. Yeah. And then she'd throw something, maybe breast milk, to make the vegetables more palatable. Pal 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 Remember that word? It was palatable. Yeah. And then she would make like a little fruit smoothie, maybe some blueberries, some some nuts, yeah. like that. And then she did say that potatoes and stuff like that. When did you when did you guys start with her on solid foods? It's been a couple months now. Um, since the beginning of summer. So when you left some, so you would leave one bottle on the counter, mm -hmm. so that could be room temperature. Yeah. And then you put how many typically in the fridge? About three. Okay, and then. How many did you typically have on tap in the freezer? Oh boy. Like 12. And so those are just um, in the bottle, nipple inverted. And no, How's that they're work? not in the bottle. Okay. They're in a, a freezer safe pouch. Oh, like a, and that, oh, and that gets stuffed down into a bottle? No, the pouch gets put into a, a pot and then you, um, with not boiling water, but warm enough water so it defrosts, uh -huh. and then you pour it into a bottle. Oh, I gotcha. And then let it sit so it's not too hot. And so you would keep about 12 of those in a freezer yes. guesstimate. Yes. Okay. Did she leave you bottles of breast milk to nurse her, or did you not no. nurse? No, we just had, uh, that's when I would get her solid food. Okay. So, um, so in October. So from uh, so October 23rd to November 23rd, one to, to December to January, the first, so basically the first four full months, she was fresh from the source bre breast fed as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And same story, if you went somewhere, she went with you, yeah. Seth never had to feed her. No. So and for four months, anyway. she never fed her. No. Okay. No way. So at, at what point um, did you guys become concerned about her weight? Um. Okay, so... <laughs> It's always kind of it's it's always kind of been there. It's always been something that we watched. 
Um, however, it never, I'll say it never seemed to cause because it never, it never did. Uh, but I just felt you guys are watching my words. So, um, it never caused her, let's put it this way. She never was sickly in any way, mm -hmm. slow, lethargic, um, that no, no, no health indicators right. that said anything was wrong other than that she was skinny, which I just, I, re, I didn't, I, I just didn't let it get to me um, because, like I said, very skinny. Um, she started putting on weight recently. We really started really, you know, pounding the uh, the solid food down in the last like month or so. Really makes you get some chicken, potatoes, cheese, stuff. How, how recently was that? A month. Month. There are two. Okay. And um, Cause that's what Tatiana said. Is that a, a, probably the last month or two is when you guys actually became a little concerned about the weight. Yeah. How how do you feel about weight size? Was she okay or was she? I was a tad concerned, but then I remembered. Um, and my mom she'll just worry about anything. Sure. Yeah. Then I remembered Elizabeth. And help it teach you what then and how she would fill in lengthwise, but not widthwise, until she was about a year. So what what, what was your tab concern? What was, what was that? Was she just not gaining enough weight, or was that the concern? It was possibly. It was just. Um, I think what got to me was seeing like other babies just so chunky and and always hearing like, oh, she's so small, and it's like, yes, yeah, she's she's premature, she's petite. Mm -hmm. alone, yeah, you know, alone. Yeah. Also, I forget, like, all these babies are formula fed, and there's nothing against formula. Sometimes you always need to do it, mm -hmm. but the formula is what chunks up the baby. Sure, sure. And I just didn't do that. Um, so then I got it out of my head. It was just so good. So it, you had a little bit of a concern due to her weight, but not her length, but you weren't overly concerned you got it out of your head because you realized that she's fine. You know, yeah, I was, I was getting not overly nice. Like, totally. Well, we all can do that. So at six months, other than a little bit underweight, you considered her to be appropriate size. Yes, and okay. developmentally as well. I mean, she was. She was doing real well developmentally. Yeah. The investigation revealed Seth fed the baby four cups of solid food, an excessive amount that sheds light on the child's feeding practices and highlights his neglect, especially in the mother's absence. This overfeeding is critical evidence, positioning Seth as a potential suspect. The case against him is strengthened by his inconsistent statements, attempts at cover-up, and visible signs of nervousness, all of which contribute to the mounting evidence of his guilt. So, so a month or two ago, you two became concerned and started putting some proteins to her, some chickens and cheeses and whatever, just, just trying to bulk her up a little mm -hmm. bit. And, and did you believe it was starting to work? I seem to definitely notice that she was getting heavier. Um, Tatiana mentioned it to me. My mom mentioned it to me, so I would say yes. So Tatiana thought she was she was getting healthier too, and that she was getting bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because um, she's always been growing long. She's just never put the meat like that's not. She's yeah. never put the meat on. Right, right. Yeah, I don't know. You know, um, but you don't really think what? too much of it at the time. Um, good, good. Um. So. Uh, Sorry. Oh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. But Seth, here's the thing: is that she's so tiny. Was it? Was there never a time that you just like, well, there's something really wrong? There was never a time where I thought there was something really wrong. Um, I did say to Tatiana, you know, hey, um, you know, with her being the age she is, let's really try to see if like the protein. Um, the, the fat and the protein it, as she, her digestive system is developed, let's see if that kicks things into gear. And if not, you know, let's we'll see a doctor. Because, right. um, you know, she's, she's getting a little girl. When did you have that conversation? I too. Seth's anxiety is set to intensify as detectives, armed with insights from both Tatiana and him, pose the critical questions of the case. Why did he contact a lawyer before calling 911 upon discovering the baby's condition? And what led to his failure to check on the baby for an extended period of 38 hours? Um, yeah, you know, I just kind of like woke up like a regular day. I wasn't feeling very well last night. 
Um, so I kind of, I, I slept in because I didn't sleep very well. Um, um, I, I think I rolled out of bed like 8 to 8.30, took care of some chores, uh, and then I laid back down. Um, and then my wife told me she was uh, going to go right up the street to the neighbor's house to go get some kids. Um, and when she came back, I woke up, and then I guess she decided, you know, come in. And, and that's that. So, the, so the, what did you do when she told you that? I had split out of bed and raced to the room. And, you know, so they're helpless, right? Like, what you know, what to do? What am I gonna do? Yeah. I could, I, I could, I could tell she was dead. Despite significant portions of the interrogation being redacted, it's notable how Seth discusses his daughter's death with a casual and calm demeanor, suggesting a disturbing detachment from the gravity of the situation. So talk, yeah, I couldn't. She's a mom. Right. She's good. So, yeah. um, I'm used to dealing with a lot of dead bodies, but the farm. Yeah. So I know what they look like. Um, that was it. So what did Tatiana do? She tried to do CPR. So, were you, sorry, were you in there when she, was doing in the same room with her when she was trying CPR? Yeah, I thought, yeah. And then what were you doing? She's the one who knows how to do all that kind of stuff. Right. So I was just, I was looking and watching and um, just thinking about what to do, thinking about, you know, just trying to think about what to do next. So what did you do next? Call my dad. Okay, and then what did you tell your dad? I, I don't know what to do. How are you, how are you sir? Well, I, I kind of figured I was supposed to call the police. Um, I just, I, I don't know. I don't have any experience with it now. Um, well, I didn't then. I do now. Um, so I, I just called them and, you know, said, hey, hey should, I, should I call the police or, or what? I don't, I don't know how this works. Um, and he said, yeah, um, you know, we'll be on the way. Um, you know, call them when, when we get there kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it had been about an hour and some change, and I was starting to get impatient because I did not want to. I know I know how it looks when people wait to make a police call, so I so you know I just. Mm -hmm. So you called prior to. Your... So I so I got impatient. I called my wife. Are you are you guys here yet? Cause you're, you know it's like eleven oh five now. I don't want to. I don't. I knew this was going to be a process too, so I want to get things going. Yeah. And um, yeah, they were in Cedar uh, at the gas station, and so um, they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll be there. And so then I called you guys. So, um, yeah, because obviously you, you're a thousand man, so you know, obviously for us, and you just tell yourself it looks weird, right? And the, but you, I'm saying you don't know what you're doing, but in our world, we deal with this a lot, because we don't know every single person in the county and everyone's personalities. Sure. Um, and I would have, I wanted to just like call you guys first, but not, I, I was following my legal advice. So, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry if that, there's a problem at all. I just, uh, just do what the lawyer told me to do. No, nope. and well, here's the thing. I'm not saying, I'm just telling you, I'm just confirming what you said. It looks weird. You know, is that, is, is that's all. We're not like saying that you did something horrible in those two hours. We're just saying that, you, you know, it's not the, it's not the norm. So, sure. Um, so what did you guys do during the two hours? We sat there and cried. Yeah. Tatiana called in her job. Yeah. We knew guests were coming. Did clean anything up? Yeah, we cleaned up the house a little bit. Why was that? This is a mess. Yeah. I knew we were going to have my parents over. So, <laughs> um, so, so um, yeah, um, you didn't have too Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, you know, we like, so what all, what all the house cleaning entail? Um, wiping up the counter. Amidst a situation as grave as the death of a 10-month-old, Seth's focus on the disorder at home strikes as inappropriately timed, suggesting either premeditation 
or a chilling emotional disconnection similar to psychopathy. Throughout the interrogation, he frequently defers to Tatiana for critical parental duties like shopping and feeding the children. Notably, Tatiana had to perform CPR in a dire moment, stressing Seth's neglectful conduct. His awareness of the wrongdoing is evident, and it's anticipated he will attempt to justify his actions to Tatiana. However, before such a confrontation, detectives revisit Tatiana to discuss inconsistencies in her account that may also implicate her. All right, we're out. Just finishing up, we'll stop from there. Okay. So, Seth basically said the same thing you said. Except for Seth, that he, he did say that you'd have to strap him and his family down to the table before a doctor could touch you guys. You don't agree with that? I... You don't have that same belief? I do, for the most part. I, I except for the... I mean, if somebody had a broken leg, he tends to be a bit dramatic. Um, he grew up reading Shakespeare. Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe he's a good Yeah. yeah. Um, he's a smart guy, though. Very. Yeah. And he's, he's very passionate and dramatic. So I'm not surprised he said that. But, um, so he said that his mom, starting to about a month ago, has been telling him, I don't know if she told you, oh, that, yeah. that that child needs some medical care. Yes, she has. How many times has she told him that? I don't know how many times she told him. How many times she told you that? Once and I count on that. Okay. How long ago was that? About a month ago. Okay. And That's she. Last hour. Now he said that she was just at your house, not this last Sunday, but the Sunday before that. Uh, yeah. Oh. I mean, maybe, because we went to Golden Corral, so it could have been a few days before that and he could be mixing Sunday up. Like, um, but it was definitely within the month. I just, huh? Date sure. So within the last, she was at your house? Yeah, and, and she's still interested on. She's still interested on I mean, how many times has she insisted on it? Um, there was once that, I only recall one time. It could have been twice sometimes because I, um, I, I may have brushed it off the first time she mentioned it. She's like, oh, no, we're not going to talk to her. Just doesn't matter. Okay. And what did she say that time? She suggested instead of asked. Well, she suggested having noted she keeps her redder and fuller several times. Thought that she was keeping her food well. Yeah, I'll try. All right, well, we're going to try to get you guys out of here right now. I'm just going to step out and talk to him real quick and just make sure we don't have more follow-up questions so we don't have to keep bothering you tonight. So let me just okay. just take a couple minutes with him, and I'll be right back with you, okay? Um, I could use the restroom already. I'm sorry. I, just, I really have to go. Oh, no, sorry. That's, that's our mistake. Okay. We, we asked someone that was in there, and he did this to us, and he must have forgotten about you. Oh, so that's fine. That's our mistake. Okay. That's okay. The detectives have now established that the shared anti-medical stance of both parents directly contributed to their daughter's death. Despite Tatiana's emotional distress, it's evident she merely aligned with her husband's decisions, repeatedly affirming his intelligence even in crisis, failing to distance herself from his unfavorable views. This commitment suggests she might have unintentionally implicated herself by supporting his choices. The vital moment is awaited when the couple is brought together for a sincere exchange, providing a deeper insight into their dynamics. With the detectives having access to Seth's phone and Tatiana's car consented to be searched by them, further evidence is expected to verify the conclusions drawn about their responsibility and Seth's shameless acceptance of the situation. How are you doing? How are you? Happy that I'm with you now. Me too. Did you have to hire us at all while you were waiting? I'm so scared. Yeah, I'm more. Because we're such bad parents. Not even allowed to talk to them. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.
Hey, yeah. Took so long asking me all about the kids offering them birth, weight, height, and eating habits, and developmental skills. And Code here, PA tool. And then I think that was a distraction because right after that, it was just like, why did it take you so long to call? I just kept berating with that weight on the answer. So you saw the one. You call the police after it. Oh. Biting it out. I told you like six times. I was waiting for the lawyer to be there because we knew that this would happen. That's why I told them they were waiting for I didn't see your parents, but I said, lawyers. And they were just, I don't want you to do while you're waiting. I called off work. I, I slept. And I sat and cried. Oh, you're. I said, listen to this, baby. You, their job is to fill cells. It's their job. So they can fill two cells right now. They're not just late. They're like angry. Like it sounded like they were trying out the be moldy night, but like separate us. That's what they're doing. Trying to drive the wedge in between it and help somebody accuse of the other. That's why they came at you first. Because they're, because they own them. They can probably look at me. Yeah. They can have their shit to them. So if I make a big breakdown of the cutie of the ball, I'll block up. We need to see what they're looking for. Or if you can know what's going to happen. You go on and then we get really bad to me. But I really like to not talk about it at all anymore today. Okay. It's so terrible. It's so terrible. Can't ever do this again. We at least gotta take her. We gotta, there's problems. We gotta take her to the doctor at least to see. Okay. Yep. By this point, the reality of their situation had fully dawned on Seth and Tatiana, confronting the severe consequences of their anti medical system beliefs. Facing the consequences of their actions, they returned to the police station on August 3, 2018, this time as convicts. While the initial interrogation highlighted their neglect, Seth's following questioning aimed to solidify evidence of his guilt. Now it sounds like you may have been expecting us to come today. It's bad to talk to you today. Uh, oh, you mean here? Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I... I mean, I, I expected all of the worst, so, yeah, you did. Pretty much, that's pretty much what I come to expect of the U.S. government, so. Yeah. Separate, if you can do me a favor, don't separate us from the U.S. government, because we're not the U.S. Well, government. I know you guys are part of the machine, though, so. Yeah, we try to keep our stuff out of the machine, but. And I, I can respect you for saying that, though. Um, I kind of get where you're coming from on that, some of the stuff. Um, just I ask you not make us all the same brush because we're not all the same. Okay? We're, I think we're pretty decent guys. He's kind of a jerk sometimes. But. In this follow-up interrogation, Seth's behavior shifts dramatically. He adopts an aggressive stance, attempting to intimidate the detective. However, the detective, experienced and unfazed by such tactics, remains unaffected by Seth's efforts to dominate the exchange. Well, you said you kind of expected us to come back, but what, what made you think we were going to come back? Well, you got your job is to fill cells. So there's a there's fill, fill, oh, cells? Yeah. So, I mean, that's, a, that's the purpose for the truth. No, why, why would you say that rat hole? Just, I'm out there. I know that. When you, I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. what makes you think you're out there, though? I think what you, when you say you're out there, what you believe, though, is what you believe. Even though you think others think you're out there, you think what you're, is correct, right? That you're there. Yes. All right. I don't think you're that far out there, but the doctor, the video on top scene, yes, says he's been like this for a long, a while. With the cop, he said she hasn't eaten or drank enough to cause her down. Uh, that's I, 
you guys have a search warrant, and I'm happy to let them renew it and have you go through my garbage and see all the other things. Uh, right. Uh, here we are in a second, okay? Yeah. I'm not saying you're not a caring guy, because I think you absolutely are. I think Tatiana's a very caring lady. I think with the kid that you guys have, the farm you're trying to run, and with the pressures of providing for your family, I think some oh, yeah. meals got missed over the last couple of months. And gradually, so. The detective skillfully navigated the interrogation, gradually easing Seth from a defensive posture with closed hands to a more receptive, open-handed stance. Leveraging this newfound openness, the detective introduces an alternate theory, suggesting the death was accidental and not directly the fault of Seth or Tatiana. This strategic approach aims to lower Seth's guard and encourage honesty about the inconsistency, the reason behind his baby's significant underweight condition, despite his claims of feeding her four cups of solid food. She always eats all four cups. She always eats everything. Yeah. Never seen it. She still wash the back up. I mean, you know, she still she spits up a little bit, but not even that. I mean, I got like little bad stains mm -hmm. from from see, yeah, I'm not huh, bullshitting you guys. Like right. this is from me carrying her. Yep. And then um sorry, but I know I know this is tough for you. And we're not like so we're not here to pick on you. Seth's fidgeting observed when he looks at the stain, suggests he might be either nervous from delivering a false narrative or emotionally affected by the reminder of his daughter, leading to visible distress. She cries whenever she's something wrong, whenever she's uncomfortable, whenever she's hungry, upset, and anyway, she'll, she'll let you know, quick. Like, she's been, she's worse than the other kids about crying, but... In that brief statement, Seth unintentionally reveals his perception of his daughter Mary as a burden, this insight suggests that Mary's needs and behavior pose significant challenges for him, unlike his other children, who may have been easier to manage. Such an admission hints at a deeper motive, potentially indicating that the actions taken or not were driven by a desire to ease the supposed burden on his mental well-being and financial situation. Something where it's just like, okay, obviously, you know, bone broken, but if it's going to be something where basically some guy in a white coat, no offense, I don't have a coat, it's fine. Has a graph that says, oh, well, she needs to be this many inches and this much weight. And since she's not, we're going to call CPS and put you on this drug program. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's that. I don't buy into it. That's a scam. Mm -hmm. maybe, uh, maybe I'm wrong or God just has, uh, has his will and his plan for things, but I did not. Um, uh, so I kind of just honestly thought that, you know, if I did the right things, I did it better right. You know, he made sure to you know, just love her and, and love her for who she is and not try to, um, you know, secularly, religiously beat her over the head with uh, all different kinds of things because she didn't match up to something on a graph. Seth returns to criticizing the medical system, which had identified malnutrition as a critical issue for his daughter. Instead of addressing the remedy suggested by healthcare professionals, he is stuck on the inconvenience it would pose to him, demonstrating a reluctance to take necessary actions for his daughter's health. Do you know that she weighed one pound and four ounces more than when she was born? No, I do not. One pound and four ounces more than a baby. She weighed less than a lot of babies are. The detective emphasizes the baby's alarmingly low weight at the time of her death by repeating the figure twice, aiming to provide Seth with a blunt reality check. I have a photograph of her right here on my email, if you'd like to see it, so you can at least see what we're looking at. Oh, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure it looks terrible. I'm sure you guys are seeing the absolute worst of it. And Do you want to see that? I don't really want to. If you not, I will not make you. So I will not. I, I saw your that, and that was quite enough for me. I'd like you to look at it, but I would not. I would never. Don't ever confuse that I'm going to demand that you look at it. You're, you're her dad. I'll give you the option if you want to look at it, so you at least can intelligently um, speak about what we're speaking about. If you don't, what do? What would you prefer? 
Well, I already closed the booth. You want to show it to me? I'll look at it. Right. But you don't want to. Not really, no. Okay. The reason I, I don't even bring it up to try to gross anyone out here. It's just have to see what, to see through our lenses and see if that's what you recall. See, is that what you remember? Um, why don't you go ahead and show it to me? I can tell you what I remember from the day before she looked like Seth's reaction to sitting with his arms crossed signifies a defensive posture, a common body language cue indicating that he feels accused and is psychologically bracing himself against the allegations. This, this is her size. That's what she looked like when we, when we removed his parents. Observing Seth's reaction to his deceased daughter's picture, where he displays no tears or visible emotional response, suggests a significant emotional detachment from the situation. This lack of reaction indicates that he may not publicly mourn or display any emotional response to the case, including triggers that might deeply affect Tatiana. The term, she died. She's dehydrated and helpful. Starvation and dehydration. And here, here's the thing, we're not, I know, I know, I get it, I get it, I just, I don't, the thing for me is I, it, it's, it's almost like a, like a hellish miracle, because I don't, I don't know how, I gotta remember going like this, you know, I'm gonna talk to you okay, neither of us is saying that either of you don't love your kids, because it is obvious, you do, okay, it's obvious. But it's also very obvious that you're lying to us right now. By your reckoning. No, hold on. Now by my reckoning. Yes, because you can't, you weren't there, you can't say. And so to say that it's a lie, you know, that's something you're going to have to bring up with God in your own day. Hold on. What? Okay, I got the evidence, man. But, so here's what, I guess I'd say it this way, is that, that the enemy, okay, we're not doctors, what the enemy is saying is that, is that she's not. Okay, that's what, she, that, that's what I'm saying. So, if, if, that's, if that's the case, we're not in Christmas either. But there wasn't enough frequent cheatings to The detective employs the infamous alternate theory approach as part of the read technique, where various theories are presented to the suspect, leaving gaps for them to fill. In this instance, the theory suggests the possibility of accidental starvation, indirectly implicating Seth in the neglect without directly assigning blame. You know the back the M.E. said, and he does, she at least two autopsies a day, hundreds of them a year, hundreds in his, probably thousands in his career, and he remember seeing a case this bad. Looks like she was in a concentration camp. And, and I just, it, everything you're saying to me is terrible and makes me feel like absolute shit, but I don't know what to say because I, I fed her. Do you think people in concentration camps that look like that got that way overnight? No, but they gradually start looking worse like that for a while. So much so that your wife thought a couple of days ago she was probably going to die. And my guess is, now see, I'll tell you, I think you're lying because she would have said her words were gravely ill and that she thought she was going to I also know you guys are cops. We do from time to time. Are we lying to you now? Absolutely. Which is also why there's no emotion because you already knew she was going to die a couple of days ago and had already come to grips with the fact that she was going to die. Now you sit across from this table and call yourself my brother and say things like that. I, I, I think it's possible, you tell me. The detectives confront Seth about his lack of emotional response throughout the case, yet his behavior remains unchanged. Seth continues to display a cold, emotionless demeanor, maintaining his defensive posture without any visible reaction to the accusation. I can tell you for a fact, for a fact, Seth, that she looked like this for at least a week, because you knew something was wrong. Honestly, you didn't necessarily feed her. Maybe you thought she had a disease or something like you missed earlier. But she looked like that for a while and you knew the new share problem. No. The reason why I might deal with it, no emotion, I was crying in the holding cell. 
But what do you what do you think we were doing for the hour before I called you guys? What do you think we were doing all last night? I'm used to, I'm you know, you don't know what I've been through to get me here. You know, and I'm not I'm not coming out with a I'm not coming out with a victim story or pity me, but it hasn't been the easiest walk for me. Despite any claims of remorse, Seth's demeanor remains consistently cold and detached throughout the interrogation, casting doubt on the sincerity of his expressions. His attempt to express hardship or remorse is damaged by his previous behavior, which has been consistently emotionless and defensive. The detectives remain unconvinced by his attempts to manipulate their opinion and see through his facade. I, I don't have... I... You know, my very, my very straight pastor answer is that, um, you know, God gives and God takes away. And, um, you know, I try to do the best according to my understanding. Um, how did she get so skinny and thin? Like I said, I, I don't know, because I, I used to feed her. I, I think we're kind of past the result of why, and I think we're just trying to get a confession of something. Yes, I'd love a confession of something. Like, you... Do you think you have any role in this? Of course I don't. That's that. Well, I there's, there's, there's criminal liability. You don't think there's a criminal liability case? Come on, I finish. Yeah. Whether there's criminal liability found or not, I'm still responsible for anything that could have been done different, anything that could be changed. Well, anything, what do you think could have been done different? Well, of course, you know, the, top, the standard party line answer is, you know, go see the doctor and see what's wrong as to why she's not gay. Seth asserts that he understands what the detectives expect him to admit, but refuses to comply because he genuinely doesn't believe he's at fault for neglect. He maintains his stance on distrusting modern medicine and insists he thought his daughter was healthy. This ongoing dialogue between Seth and the detectives has revolved around these conflicting viewpoints since the beginning, but now, the notion of him being a neglectful parent has begun to weigh heavily on his mind. Let's go to the natural answer. We don't let her sleep 15 to 18 hours and we feed her. No doctor necessary. Um, I've never... Well, uh, I've never encountered that to be a... Advice, medical issue. I, I, Don't come on. I haven't. She obviously had a medical issue, though. Right? My heart, this big grace for you and her. I mean, not really, otherwise you guys wouldn't be trying to destroy what's left. You don't understand that, too. What, what should we be doing, then? What, I mean, what no, no, if this was your neighbor, what should we be doing? It, what should we do differently? Well, I, I don't think that putting you, to be honest, I don't think putting either one of us in jail. Seth shifts the blame onto the detectives accusing them of tearing his family apart by holding him and Tatiana accountable for the situation. He fears that once Tatiana discovers his neglect, it will irreparably damage their relationship, as she might lose respect for him despite her loyalty to his values. However, Seth anticipates that Tatiana's respect may disappear after learning the shocking truth he reveals with brutal honesty. There is no, there's no justice for her. There's no, there's no, there's no crime. There's no, it, there's no crime in this. Look, I'm, I know that the American court system will come up with a crime. I, part of the reason why it, it's like hard for me is because this is a very new idea that that like just every time somebody dies, it has to be like somebody has to go into a box or, or somebody's got to be convicted. I mean, it, it used to be common for kids not to make it. Um, it's called natural selection, and it's a hard part of real life on Earth. Um, do you think she was part of natural selection? She, I mean, she's always been small. She's always... Uh, I you don't know how she feel bad about this. What do you think? Based on Seth's cold and remorseless remarks throughout the interrogation, it appears that he has accidentally provided more evidence to support a charge of murder rather than just neglect. 
his lack of emotional response, defensive posture, and refusal to acknowledge responsibility despite mounting evidence suggest a deeper level of guilt in his daughter's death. There's a difference between, you know, almost sounds to me like you're saying, oh, she was weak. Oh, well, I don't care about it. I don't know that's how you take it, but I, I'm, not, I'm not really too, too worried about it when I get up in front of a judge or a jury, so. It, it's, it's a hard thing for me. It's a hard thing for me. If, hypothetically, you had a million dollars, would you then send your kids to the doctor? Uh, is that, would, I, would I be more apt to seek, um, you know, medical advice, attention? Yes, I would. If, if it was uh, something that was more affordable, easier to access, yes, I would. Do you think you've done anything wrong? Seth's fixation on the idea that he didn't directly take a life and his belief that police involvement is mere interference suggests a disturbing lack of empathy and accountability for his actions. He seems ignorant of the deep impact the incident has had on Tatiana, demonstrating a selfish focus on returning to normality despite the irreparable harm caused. However, as the detective reads him his charge, it becomes clear that Seth's desire to resume a normal life is merely a useless ambition in the face of the serious consequences awaiting him. Uh, I'll, I'll say, guys, I'm a little surprised that uh, felony murder. I thought maybe, you know, reckless endangerment, child endangerment, something like that. Well, so that's, that's the arrest. That's the arrest and a posture in the Yeah. Okay. Um, we, we do not have... Yeah, I was going to say you guys haven't even had time to, like, no. go to court or anything. No, no that's right. Cause so Seth Welch was convicted of first-degree murder and received a life sentence without parole in June 2020. In 2021, Tatiana Fusari testified against her husband, alleging abuse and manipulation, claiming he prevented her from seeking medical care for their children. Her testimony led to her own conviction for first-degree murder, resulting in a life sentence without parole alongside an additional 15 to 30 years for first-degree abuse. The most striking moment of the case was the couple's stunned reaction upon hearing their sentences. Then, Seth and Tatiana realized the seriousness of their actions and the irreversible consequences awaiting them behind bars. Their expressions captured the realization that they would spend the rest of their lives confined within prison walls, unable to experience freedom again. Remember, it's your curiosity that fuels this channel. Keep exploring, stay inspired, and join us for more amazing content next time.